for that. Anyway, fascinating fact. Uh, there have been more American astronauts than there have been British Airways Concorde pilots. Uh, it's an elite club, and there's no more senior member of this club than Concorde's chief pilot, Mike Bannister. The computer that controls the position of the ramps was a breakthrough in aviation, the first digital computer. It also was the one thing that the British got right in the development of the aeroplane that the Americans and the Russians couldn't get right. And that's what makes Concorde so efficient and enables us to fly at Mark II without the use of reheats. It's one of the things that, one of the three things that makes the aeroplane function correctly. That's one, the ability to transfer fuel from the front of the aeroplane to the back to keep it balanced in flight is the second. And the very clever design of the wing that controls the way that the aerodynamic center of lift moves is the third. I've always wanted to be a pilot ever since I was seven. And uh, I went from school straight to pilot training college at Hamble. And when I was doing my final exams, that's when I first saw Concorde fly. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a Concorde pilot. Now, I've been in cockpits before, and they've been rather disappointing in that they look rather like video games. But this. This is like something out of a documentary my old man's got about Lancaster bombers. I mean, it really does feel it really does feel the part. I think it's a great. I mean, one of the reasons there's so much in here is there are so many more systems. Um, the airplanes rather like four airplanes. We fly twice as high, twice as fast. So we've got four, four times as many systems. The area we've got is a little less because we're at the, the front of a very streamlined body. And thirdly, it was designed, of course, in the in the late 60s, early 70s. And it's a great tribute to the designers. They got it right first time. Nobody's disputing that it was a great engineering achievement, but could they have done anything better? No, I, I, when you think that even today, Concorde is the only aircraft that's capable of flying across the Atlantic twice the speed of sound. It can fly at Mark II for over three hours. Um, it can get to the edge of space. When the sky gets darker, you can see the curvature of the Earth. It can do all of that in complete luxury for our customers. The only other people that are in that sort of area are wearing spacesuits. They're wearing lounge suits. I know you're a pilot, and with respect, you're not a businessman, but you must have a view on the fact that so much money was spent to get Concorde flying again after the Air France disaster. And then why, why bin it a matter of months later, really? I think it's two separate decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the decision to put the airplane back in the air was the right one for the right reasons. Uh, when we were doing that piece of work, we looked not only at the safety implications of the modifications that we're doing, but also at the business case for spending 17 million pound on modifications and 14 million pound on the new interiors. And that business case stood up very robustly. What we couldn't foresee as we were bringing the aircraft back into service during that period of time was what happened on September the 11th. That happened to be the first route proving flight in the program to bring the aircraft back. We talked to our customers again, and for the first three to six months of operation, you know, we were doing really well, making good returns, and, and our customers were flying with us. What happened then was a combination of other things, foot and mouth in the UK, SARS worldwide, general economic downturn. In the US in particular, people were traveling less. Generally, people had less money available to spend for, for travel budgets. They were downsizing their companies, looking for cuts here, there, and everywhere. And what we saw was a, a downturn in our premium market. At the time, the manufacturers came to us and said, over the next two years, we're going to need to spend an additional £40 million over budget on other engineering and maintenance aspects of Concorde, some of which are not even Concorde-related. Um, actually, the physical act of flying it, uh, how how different is that to flying a 747? I mean, she's an absolute delight to fly. You can you can fly her with your fingertips from takeoff all the way through climb, acceleration, supersonic flight, deceleration, descent and landing. She's very responsive, a bit like a thoroughbred racehorse rather than a riding school hack or a truck rather than a, a right. sports car rather than a truck. And she's an absolute delight to fly and very rewarding too because she can be flown with great precision. And so it's a very rewarding aeroplane for a pilot's point so of you view. So it's possible to fly it badly is the obverse of that. Aspect. Yeah, it is, and that's one of the reasons that at the, the training course to train pilots from other aeroplanes onto Concorde is six months long, whereas a training course onto, say, a 747 is about two and a half months. And that's because there are so many different systems to learn, different forms of aerodynamics, different ways of operating the aeroplane. As Concorde flies supersonically, she's travelling very quickly, and what happens is the air rushes past, and the friction of the air and the compression of the air heat up the fuselage. And in fact, the fuselage it heats up to 127 degrees Celsius, and that's hotter than boiling water at sea level. So the whole thing expands, and it grows between 6 and 10 inches in supersonic flight. Now, fortunately, the designers anticipated that, so throughout the aeroplane, they've put areas of expansion where the aeroplane literally gets bigger as it's hotter and cools again and gets smaller. 
the only visible one of those is on the flight deck and it's by the side of the flight engineer's panel between the engineer's panel and the bulkhead on the ground you can't get your fingernail in there when you're supersonic you can get your whole hand in there that gap opens right up there's a lovely apocryphal story about a pilot on an early test flight putting his cap in there in the supersonic flight when they got on the ground he couldn't get it out Will you admit ever to have been starstruck by looking over your shoulder and saying, blimey, there's Her Majesty the Queen or something? I've met some fascinating people. I think that my favourite was Rudolf Noriev. I'm very keen on the ballet. And uh, I met him once. He was travelling on board. And that was in the days when people could come on the flight deck. And he came up and we were chattering away. And it turned out that his idea of the best ballet he'd ever danced was Giselle at Covent Garden, which I'd seen. Uh, it was great amusing that he'd seen me work and I'd seen him work. There's not room for a pirouette in here, though, is there? Well, you, you can if you're very agile, and he yeah. was. It's cosy. I just wonder, 10 or 15 years' time, somebody will decide, well, supersonic air travel, let's get back to it. How will it have to look when that happens? I just can't envisage the human race taking a backward step forever, and I can't envisage my daughter, who's nine, to, talking to her children in the future and saying, do you remember when Grandad used to cross the Atlantic in three hours and 20 minutes and now it always takes eight and a half hours? I'm convinced that there will be a next generation of supersonic flight at some stage. Concord's chief pilot, Mike Bannister.